Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Ila Jain Khandelwal, a pathology faculty for MARO. Now students, we have come up with this new module called as Clinical Edge Plus. What I have done in this module is, I have recorded a lot of clinical cases which I saw while I was doing my residency in Sabdajang Hospital and RML Hospital, right? Now, why we have recorded these clinical cases is because that is the need of the day. In the MCQ exams, you will see a lot of questions are asked in a clinical form. So, there will be a history, you have to come to a diagnosis and then the options will be uh, something related to that like the pathogenesis or the histopathological features or the treatment and so on, right? That is why uh, today if you need to study for entrance exams, you need to study in a clinical and pathologic pattern or the integrated study is the need of the R, right? So, whenever you pick up medicine, do the pathology also simultaneously. That is how you will uh, progress and you will become good doctors as well, right? So, along with clinical cases students, I have added a lot of USMLE type questions also which can be asked in the new pattern of next exam, right? So, those questions usually have long clinical stems and usually have five or six options instead of four options, right? So, a lot of those questions also I have tried to include in this video. Hope you enjoy and like the video and this video I am sure is going to help you out in your INICET, uh, the FMG or or the need or the next exam, right? So, without wasting any more time, let us start with the various questions and the clinical scenarios, right? First of all, students, there was a 65-year-old woman who presented with shortness of breath, productive cough, chest pain and a 5 kg weight loss in a month. This is the history which is given. The patient is a retired teacher and a chronic smoker for 35 years. Then a chest x-ray was done and the image is given below, right? Now, one thing which I would like to tell you, whenever you get a long question, right, or a clinical pathologic question or a need type question or a clinical history, first of all, it is important for us to mark the keywords. Now, you will ask me, ma'am, what is a keyword? A keyword is that word which will help you to reach a particular diagnosis. Because once you make a diagnosis on a particular patient, the further thing is very easy. You will just have to treat the patient. The basic thing is to make the diagnosis, right? For that, you will require a lot of keywords like the age of the patient, the history of the patient, the examination findings of the patient, the investigations of the patient, right? So, those keywords which we, we, we will mark uh, first of all. Now, in this question, students, first of all, the patient is an elderly woman with smoking for 35 years. The history has shortness of breath, productive cough, chest pain and 5 kg weight loss in a month. Now, when you hear this history in a patient, what do you guys think of without looking at the investigations? First of all, tell me if you get this history of a smoker patient who is elderly with significant weight loss and productive cough, what will you think of? One DD which I will definitely think of is lung cancer, right? Definitely you will think about lung cancer, correct? Okay, now let us see the chest x-ray. This is the x-ray chest. Does it appear normal? No. In this x-ray chest, can you all see that there is a lesion here in the hilum? There is a mass here, right? So, this is a mass which is present. So, what I am thinking of, I am thinking that my patient has got a lung cancer. Now, what will you do in this patient? I am not giving anything else. You tell me, if you have this patient, what is the next step that you will do? Of course, you will do a biopsy from the mass to see what it is, right? So, I will take a biopsy and when the lung biopsy was done, the histopathology is given below. This is the histopathological finding which is given to you. Now, what do you see in this image? Can you people see that uh, there are these cells which are fitting into one another. I mean, their shapes are fitting into one another, right? So, which type of lung cancer has these kinds of cells? First of all, when you see this lung biopsy, do you all agree that this is not normal lung alveoli? 
this is not normal lung this is actually a tumor right now all of you know that in lung there are four common types of tumors there is squamous cell cancer small cell cancer of lung adeno cancer and large cell lung cancer four different types of lung cancer commonly right if my patient is a smoker elderly right with weight loss what is a more common uh, lung cancer which you will think of i will think of two lung cancers one is scc that is squamous cell lung cancer and another is small cell lung cancer why will i not think about adenocarcinoma because adenocarcinoma is more common in women okay this is also a women but adenocarcinoma is mostly peripherally located and adenocarcinoma is usually seen in non smoker this patient is a smoker right so i have made two differential diagnoses one is a squamous cell cancer another is small cell lung cancer so first question is answered right now when you do this slide when you see this slide does it look like a squamous cell lung cancer remember students i told you whenever there is a squamous cell lung cancer what it will show it will show keratin pearls can you see keratin pearls on this side no i cannot see any keratin pearls i see some tumor cells which have got salt and pepper chromatin can you people appreciate that the chromatin here is tippled it's like this black and white right so this chromatin students is called as the salt and pepper chromatin and the cells are fitting into each other shapes i mean this is one shape they are fitting into each other so this is called as nuclear molding so nuclear molding and salt and pepper chromatin they are features of small cell lung cancer that is why i have made the diagnosis that my patient has got a small cell lung cancer right can you do any other biochemical tests in this patient right now remember students i told you that a small cell lung cancer has the highest probability to cause para neoplastic syndromes like cushing syndromes syndrome of inappropriate adh secretion right so in any lung cancer students you can do a lot of biochemical tests like serum calcium hypercalcemia is a very common para neoplastic syndrome which is seen with squamous cell lung cancer right you can do serum adh level you can do serum acth level because cushing syndrome can occur right these are the other biochemical tests which you can do in a patient so when a examiner gives you a history in a exam or a clinical pathologic question sometimes there can be that the patient has got a lung mass the patient has got moon like faces and striae over, over the body right now moon like faces and striae are indicated that it, uh, they are symptoms of cushing syndrome so so you will start thinking in terms of small cell lung cancer understood next what will you see in the lung biopsy we have already done you will see salt and pepper chromatin nuclear molding you will also see small cells and another thing which you see here is called as the azopardi effect azopardi effect is the basophilic staining of the vessel wall right the vessel will become bluish in color why because of dna understood and last point is okay the fourth question is the marker for diagnosis what are the markers which you use for a uh, small cell lung cancer students they are positive for three markers please note they are positive for neuron specific enolase synap tofisin and chromogranin so three markers can be positive neuron specific enolase and aptofisin and chromogranin and what is the treatment uh, surgical treatment is not usually done in this patient because this is a highly aggressive tumor it has the worst prognosis of all the lung cancers so it is chemo sensitive usually chemotherapy and immunotherapy is given in this patient understood how did you come to the diagnosis of small cell lung cancer right 
Now, because uh, lung cancer is a hottest topic for an examiner, whether it is FMG, INICT or NEET or it will be next. So, that is why let us quickly revise it. Uh, all the lung cancers are more common in males except for renocarcinoma which is more common in females, right? Most of them are centrally located except adenocarcinoma which is peripherally located. Sometimes large cell lung cancer is also peripherally located, right? Now, most of them are associated with cigarette smoking except adenocarcinoma which is seen in non-smokers, right? If the examiner asks you strongest association with cigarette smoking, then that is of small cell lung cancer. It has the strongest association, correct? Paraneoplastic syndrome can also be given in the history. Hypercalcemia is associated with squamous cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer can be associated with Cushing syndrome and SIADH, right? When I come to the pathogenesis, squamous cell carcinoma can be associated with P53. Adeno can be associated with KRAS, AGFR or ALK gene mutation. Small cell lung cancer is associated with l -MIC. Remember I told you MYC is an oncogene. Three types of MYC are there. l lung cancer, c mic Burkitt's lymphoma and N for n -MIC, N for neuroblastoma. Three MYCs, very important for exams, right? Now, histopathologically, let us see the images, students. If my patient has got squamous cell cancer anywhere in the body, it is going to show you keratin pearls. In this image, can you people appreciate these pinkish pearl-like structures? What are these students? These are keratin pearls. Another thing which I see is the presence of desmosomes. Desmosomes. What are desmosomes? They are interdigitating bridges between the two squamous cells can only be seen on high power, right? If my patient has got adenocarcinoma anywhere in the body, adeno means student's glands. So, what you will see round tubular structures with the lumen. So, you will see glands which are lined by pleomorphic cells. Can you people appreciate these glandular structures? The cells which are lining the glands are not normal, they are pleomorphic, right? Next, bronchioalveolar carcinoma is now properly called as adenocarcinoma in C2. What do you see in that? Can you people appreciate these are tumor cells which are surrounding the bronchioalveolar lining and this pattern is popularly called as the lepidic pattern or the filigree pattern or the butterflies on a fence, right? So, lepidic or filigree or butterflies on a fence, right? You see tumor cells along the bronchioalveolar lining. Then students, small cell lung cancer shows small cells with nuclear molding. Can you people see? These cells are fitting into each other, molding according to the other cell's shape, right? So, what you see is nuclear molding. I have already told you salt and pepper chromatin and azopardi effect, correct? Then students, large cell lung cancer, large highly pleomorphic cell. In the MCQ exam, remember, you will not think of large cell lung cancer immediately. First, think of the other three and carcinoid syndrome because large cell lung cancer is quite uncommon and is usually a diagnosis of exclusion. If my patient is not fitting into any other category, I will put it under large cell lung cancer. Agreed? Next, carcinoid tumor, similar features, students, salt and pepper chromatin, the cells in trabeculae or nests with salt and pepper chromatin. Done? Easy story. So, this is about the various lung cancers. Let me quickly show you this uh, uh, table again, students. Uh, the last point, which is also very important, which is left is the immunohistochemical markers. For squamous cell cancer, CK, P63 and P40 are the markers. Uh, there was a question on P40 last year in INICET 2022, right? So, please remember P40 is also a marker of squamous cell lung cancer. Adenocarcinoma TTF1 and Napsin A positive. In the other session in INICET 2022 November, there was a question on Napsin A, right? Small cell lung cancer, NSC, chromogran and synaptophysin. Easy, everybody. So, this was lung cancer case in detail. Let us move to the next question now.
A gastroenterologist performs a colonoscopy on a patient with a family history of gastric and colon cancer, right? Patient has a family history of gastric cancer and colon cancer and discovers that there are multiple polyps. So, in this patient also, there are multiple polyps. So, so far I know that my patient has got polyps. Biopsy of one lesion is shown. On physical examination, the patient is noted to have dark pigmentation of buccal mucosa and lips. So, polyps with dark pigmentation of mucosa and lips. Which condition can you think of? Don't even look at the histopathology. You are the clinician, you are the gastroenterologist, what will you think of? If there is a patient who has polyps, family history of polyps and the patient has got dark pigmentation here in the lips and oral mucosa. I will start thinking in terms of Peutzeger syndrome. Understood? So, what is the diagnosis which I have made based upon the clinical history? It can be Peutzeger syndrome. Now, let us look at the biopsy. What do I see in the biopsy? Can you see there are these interdigitating uh, fibers of lamina propria of connective tissue in between this polypoid structure, right? So, this kind of uh, histopathology is basically seen in Peutzeger syndrome, right? When there are these fibers of lamina propria and uh, these fibroblasts which are going in, term, in intersecting fascicles in between the polypoid area, right? This appearance is also called as the Christmas tree appearance, right? Now, seeing the history, I have come to all these things, right? Let me see what are the questions which are asked. What is the most likely diagnosis? You already know the diagnosis is Peutzeger syndrome, PJ syndrome. Understood? Three very important, four very important points and keywords. Uh, the patient has a family history of gastric and colon polyps. The patient himself is a polyp. The patient has darkish pigmentation of the oral mucosa. And fourthly, the histopathology. Everything is uh, going in terms of PJ syndrome, right? What is the genetic abnormality in this case? Now, now, I always say, if you make the diagnosis correctly, I have made the diagnosis correctly, you will know everything related to that very easily, right? What is the genetic abnormality? You know, 50% of cases of PJ syndrome are due to LKB1 STK11 gene mutation. So, that is the answer. If the examiner asks you what are the other cancers which the patient is at risk of, the answer is the patient is at risk of lung cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, right? So, lots of other cancers can occur in this patient. The patient is at increased risk of. If I ask you what kind of a polyp is seen in Peutzeger syndrome, the answer is it is the hamartomatous polyp. What kind of a polyp is this? It is a hamartomatous polyp. Understood? Easy? Got the clinical scenario? Very popularly asked question is GI polyps and Peutzeger syndrome. Please remember everything about it. Understood? Let's move further. A 13-year-old boy presents to the emergency with a deep skin abrasion on his knee, right? He states that it has not stopped the bleeding since it happened during a recess approximately 20 to 30 minutes ago. That means the patient has been bleeding since the past 20 to 30 minutes, right? Physical examination reveals a well-developed adolescent. There are multiple purpura over his legs and arms and a few scattered petechiae on his chest and gums. His bleeding time is 22 minutes, platelets 3 lakh, Hemoglobin 11, a trial of cryoprecipitate transfusion does not improve his bleeding time, but a normal platelet transfusion does. Wow, such a wonderful question, students. Let me first tell you the keyword. This is a young adolescent boy with a skin abrasion on the knee, high bleeding time. Can you see the bleeding time? What is the normal bleeding time? 2 to 9 minutes. This patient has a bleeding time of 22 minutes. So, one very important point is bleeding time is increased, right? 
Now platelets, 3 lakh, that means platelet count is normal. Understood? Hemoglobin is almost normal, right? Physical examination, there is PTK and purpura. Now, with this history of PTK, purpura and high bleeding time with normal platelet count, what do you think of? First of all, students, my patient has PTK and purpura. I told you, if a patient has got minor bleeding in the form of PTK or purpura, you will more commonly think of in lines of what? I will think of mostly in line of a bleeding disorder. If my patient has a coagulation disorder students like a hemophilia A or B, what will happen? There will be major bleeding like bleeding into joints, bleeding into cavities or hemarthrosis, bleeding in the knee, painful knees, right? That is not present in this patient. There is just PTK, purpura or aberration on the knee, but there is no hemarthrosis. Also, very significant line in this patient is a trial of cryoprecipitate does not not improve his bleeding time but a normal platelet transfusion does matlab cryoprecipitate is rich in factor 8 you give cryoprecipitate to a patient of hemophilia a yes or no right so that means my patient does not have hemophilia why because cryoprecipitate say the patient is not improving the patient is improving with a platelet transfusion that means there is a defect in the platelet not in the factor 8 so that is why i come to a conclusion that my plate patient has got a bleeding disorder right now what bleeding disorder can you think of if my patient's platelet count is normal but bleeding time is high i think of two disorder students remember i told you a table students this table very very important table now in this table you can see there are two disorders in which there is bleeding time increased and normal platelet count and normal pt and aptt is this profile fitting into this yes so my di differential diagnosis can be bernard solier syndrome or glanzmann's thromboasthenia right now to confirm my diagnosis i will do platelet aggregation studies in which if my patient has bernard solier syndrome, the platelet aggregation with ristocetin is abnormal and if my patient has glasensmann's thrombosthenia, the platelet aggregation with ADP collagen and epinephrine is abnormal. So, what is the next step you will do? I will do platelet aggregation studies to confirm my diagnosis whether the patient has bernard solier or glanzmann's, right? Patient definitely does not have hemophilia or a coagulation disorder. Understood? Now, let us see what questions were asked. What are the other tests you will do to reach the diagnosis? We have already done platelet aggregation studies. What is the most likely diagnosis? 2. Bernard Sullery in which there is a defect in platelet addition, GP1B9 defect. Glanzmann's thrombosthenia in which there is GP2B3A 3 defect and there is a defect in platelet aggregation. Understood? What is the pathogenesis of this condition? We have already done the pathogenesis of both the conditions, right? Now, quick recap of this table, students, which will really help you to differentiate a bleeding and a coagulation disorder as it helped us in this clinical scenario. A bleeding disorders are mostly autosomal. That is why they are equally affected in males and females. Coagulations are usually X-linked. That is why they are more common in males as compared to females. Clinically bleeding, minor bleeding like PTK, purpura, mucosal bleeding or prolonged bleeding after injury. Coagulation defects have major bleeding like echymosis or hemarthrosis, right? When you do the lab test, in bleeding disorders, the platelet count or bleeding time can be affected whereas coagulation tests are normal. Coagulation disorders, tests are normal, right? Uh, in bleeding disorders, the PT and APTT are normal because there is no coagulation defect. Example of a bleeding defect is ITP and in coagulation defect, the PT or APTT can be affected depending upon which coagulation factor is sufficient. Easy? Also, students, let us quickly see this table. Very, very important and high yield table. I have done it in the vision as well as the main videos. Please remember this table. It will help you to reach the diagnosis. If my patient has ITP, there are antiplatelet antibodies. Platelet count is definitely decreased. Bleeding time is increased. The PT and APTT are normal. 
if my patient has HUS or TTP, in HUS, the causative factor can be E. coli O157 H7. This can also be given in the history. And in TTP, there is a mutation of Adam TS13. Both of them are microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. So, bleeding time is increased, platelet count is decreased, coagulation tests are normal. The other thing can be you see schistiocytes on the peripheral smear and the retic count is increased. The bilirubin level can also be increased, right? Next students, hemophilia A and B. You all know they are coagulation defects, hemophilia A factor 8 deficiency, hemophilia B factor 9 deficiency. All the tests are normal except for APTT which is increased in both of them. Von Willebrand's disease, there is a defect of Von Willebrand factor. The platelet count is normal but bleeding time is increased. PT is normal but ATP, APTT is increased and there is a factor 8 deficiency. If my patient has got DIC, uh, there is a abnormality in all the coagulation and the bleeding tests. Platelet count decrease, bleeding time increase, PT increase, APTT increase and if you do the level of FDP and D dimers, they are also increased, right? If my patient has got vitamin K deficiency, there is a deficiency of factors 2, 7, 9, 10 and in vascular disorders, all the blood tests are normal, right? Let's move to the next scenario. A 53-year-old woman comes to the physician because of fatigue. She reports that she has been weak and tired for the past few months and has lately be been feeling palpitations, right? She has no chronic medical condition, does not take any medicine or alcohol. Lab studies show a normochromic anemia with no reticulocytes, right? So, till now the history, I have come to the conclusion that my patient has got anemia which is normochromic. But fatigue is also there, palpitations are also there, right? The red blood cell morphology is normal. Platelets and myeloid cells are also unaffected. Bone marrow biopsy is normal cellular and is significant for a lack of erythroid precursors. But all other elements are normal, right? All the erythroid precursors are decreased. There is a lack of erythroid precursors. But the other things are normal. The other blood elements that is the myeloid and the platelets. Can you tell me students what is the diagnosis? With this history, can you people tell me? There is decreased retic count. There is anemia, definitely, decreased RBC and decreased erythroid precursors while both the myeloid and megakaryocytic precursors are normal. With this history, I come to the conclusion that this patient has got pure red cell aplasia. Remember, we used to hear about this entity PRCA, pure red cell aplasia. There is an aplasia of only the red cell, all the other lineages are normal, right? So, the diagnosis is PRCA, right? Now, as a part of management of her condition, she should be evaluated for which other condition? Very important and nice question, right? You know that this patient has got PRCA. What is the other thing which you will evaluate this patient for? I will evaluate this patient for thymoma. Remember, thymoma is very commonly associated with pure red cell aplasia. That is why that is one condition which you will associate this patient for. So, what you will do is you will do all the tests for thymoma also as a part of management, right? What will be the red blood cell morphology on bone marrow in this case? Now, this is the bone marrow. What will be the red blood cell morphology? Uh, Robin says, students, sometimes the red blood cells or the erythroid precursors so, show cytoplasmic protrusions. Can you see these cytoplasmic protrusions? Now, these cytoplasmic protrusions, they look like dog ears. That is why these are called as dog ear erythroid precursors, right? So, sometimes there can be a question, dog ear erythroid precursors can be seen in answer is pure red cell aplasia, right? Very commonly also associated with parvovirus B19 infection. Understood? Let's see the next question. 
A 43 year old man visits his physician because the skin of his face and trunk has become scaly red, right? He also complains of intense itching and 4 kgs weight loss over the past 3 months. Examination shows generalized erythroderma and non-tender lymphadenopathy. Lab study shows normal hemoglobin, platelet count 2,30,000 normal, WBC count 8,200 normal with normal DLC. A skin biopsy specimen shows the presence of lymphoid cells in the upper dermis. Similar cells are seen in the peripheral smear, a image of which is shown. Which of these marker combinations is most likely to be expressed on his abnormal lymphocytes? Such a nice question, students. See, such a long clinical stem. This is the USMLE type question which can be asked in your ne next exam, right? Now, here in this history, let us first mark the keywords. A man of middle age with some skin lesions, weight loss of 4 kgs, lymphadenopathy and lymphoid cells in the upper dermis, right? That is the significant thing. So, there is lymphadenopathy, there is erythroderma, there are these skin rashes, right? And there is the cell WBC which has got these convolutions, right? Now, they want to ask you what marker combinations are expressed on as abnormal lymphocytes, right? A very important thing is Skin biopsy shows the prints of lymphoid cells in the upper dermis. So, what can it be students? Can it be a lymphoma? Yes, this can be a lymphoma. And what kind of lymphoma occurs in the skin? It is called cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, also called as mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome. Can it be that, right? Like I always tell you, first of all, make a diagnosis correctly, right? So, this can be a case of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, also called as mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome. See the peripheral smear students. Can you see this WBC? Don't you people appreciate that this has nuclei? which has got some protrusions like uh, there is involutions inside. Don't you think it looks like cerebral hemisphere that is by these nuclei are called as cerebriform nuclei, right? Okay, so it is a T cell lymphoma. Now, let us see the option. Can uh, CD16 or 56 be expressed? No. Why? Because they are NK cell markers. My patient does not have NK cell abnormality. CD3 and CD4, what are they? They are T cell markers. So, this can be the answer till now. CD10 and CD19, these are B cell markers, right? Uh, this patient does not have a B cell lesion, so this is not the answer. CD13 and 33, these are myeloid markers, right? So, this is not the answer. Annexin A1 and 25, what are annexin A1 and 25? They are hairy cell leukemia markers, right? They are seen in hairy cell leukemia. So, this is also not the answer. So, what is the best answer in this case? CD3 and CD4. So, the important point here is that students, if you keep on revising the existing text which you have, the existing notes which you have, it is very, very important. You will be able to make a diagnosis and then answer the question related to that particular disease, right? Easy? Let's move to the next question. A 65-year-old man who is being evaluated for abdominal pain and a 5 kg weight loss undergoes endoscopy, which shows a broad region of gastric wall in which rugae are flattened, right? Biopsy of this area is given below. The cells might be expected to have which of the following properties. Now, as a student, if I see this question, I'm very sure and I'm, I get very excited that what this patient has, the patient usually has got gastric adenocarcinoma carcinoma, right? Can you see the history of 5 kg weight loss in a month along with flattened ryugae? The ryugae are flattened. What will you think of? I will think of gastric adenocarcinoma. Let you, now, let us see the biopsy students. In the biopsy, can you people see? Here, there is mucin and here, there are what kind of cells? There are these cells which look like signet ring 
So, these cells are called as signet ring cells, right? So, signet ring cells are mucin. So, what kind of adenocarcinoma this is? This is mucinous gastric adenocarcinoma, right? Now, let us answer the question. What will you see in the biopsy? Karato hyaline granules on electron microscopy. Will a mucinous carcinoma show kerato hyaline granules? No. Melanosomes seen by electron microscopy. Melanosomes will be seen in melanocytic disorder like a malignant melanoma. No. Positive staining for gastrin by light microscopy. No. Positive staining for LCA by light microscopy. No. LCA will be positive in a gastric lymphoma. Positive staining for mucin by light microscopy. Yes, because this is a mucinous adenocarcinoma, you will see positive staining for mucin. So, what is the correct answer here? It is this, right? So, clinical plus image plus microscopy, they have incorporated everything in one question. That is the new pattern which will be asked, right? And for clearing and doing these questions, what is important for all of you is have a detailed knowledge of the text, revise, keep revising the existing notes, right? Last option, dense core neurosecretory granules on electron microscopy, no. That will be seen in carcinoid syndrome. So, answer here is positive staining for mucin by light microscopy. Easy? Next, match the following. That is another thing which is usually asked these days, especially in INICT exam. RBC casts are seen in glomerulonephritis. So, RBC cast, I will match with nephritic syndrome. Hyaline casts are seen in physiological, fever, dehydration, stress. So, hyaline casts are seen in dehydration, that is the answer. WBC casts are seen in pyelonephritis, so this is the answer. Vaxi or broad casts are seen in nephrotic syndrome. And muddy brown granular casts are seen in acute tubular necrosis, right? This is how you have to do all these questions, right? Next, a 65-year-old man presents to the office with complaints regarding his urine, right? He states that he has recently had bloody urine. That means my patient has got hematuria. But does not have urinary pain, hesitation, hesitation dribbling or increased frequency. He also says he has lost 4.5 kg over the past two months. A biopsy of this patient's bladder wall is shown in the image. Which of the following risk factor has the strongest association with this patient's disease? Again, the same trend, students. First, with the history, let's make a diagnosis. For that, first of all, let's mark the important keywords, right? A elderly man with weight loss, hematuria, right and a bladder biopsy which is showing a what kind of a cancer it looks like students transitional cell cancer don't you think it is transitional cell cancer of bladder as it is students in bladder what is the most common type of cancer it is tcc or transitional cell cancer right which of the following risk factors has the strongest association with this patient's disease? Again, my students get confused with these words, strongest association, right? History of cigarette smoking, bladder cancer is seen in cigarette smokers. History of aniline dye exposure, TCC is seen in aniline dye. History of schistosomiasis can be seen, but schistosomiasis leads to squamous cell carcinoma of urinary bladder. That is why I will not mark this. History of cyclophosphamide treatment, not the strongest association. History of pelvic irradiation, not the strongest association. Now, my students get confused between two options. History of heavy cigarette smoking and history of aniline dye exposure. A lot of students when such a question comes would have marked aniline dye exposure because aniline dyes or beta nephthalamines have a very strong correlation with uh, transitional cell cancer of the bladder, right? But students, uh, cigarette smoking has the strongest association with TCC of the bladder. That is why the answer in this question is history of heavy cigarette smoking, right? So, why I have incorporated this question is, please do not get confused with these terms like strongest association. Read the question carefully, right? 
usually there will be a time or there will be questions when you are confu confused between two or three options, right? So, you have to revise your text very, very nicely so that that confusion also you can eliminate, correct? Let us move to the next history. A 53 year old woman presented to the medicine OPD with complaints of fatigue, dragging sensation in the abdomen. So, there was a woman who come to my medicine OPD with fatigue dragging sensation in the abdomen. Remember students, whenever there is a dragging sensation in the abdomen given, think about splenomegaly. The examiner is talking about splenomegaly. Physical examination showed pallor splenomegaly. Lab studies reveals hemoglobin a bit low. TLC 25,000 per cubic millimeter high, platelet count 7.8 lakhs high, peripheral smear done as shown below. Okay, now this patient came to me, I did the physical examination, I saw splenomegaly in an elderly female, right. Now when I saw splenomegaly, I did the normal blood test of the patient and the TLC of this patient was high, the platelet count was also very high, right. When I get this profile in a elderly patient, what will you think of? Come on, let give me the differential, give me the diagnosis, provisional diagnosis. As a pathologist, as a hematologist, I thought my patient can have a myeloproliferative disorder, more commonly CML. I tell my technician ki please give me the peripheral smear of this patient, right. Peripheral smear came to me and it looked like this. This was the peripheral smear picture which came to me. Can you see that this peripheral smear, the TLC is high which I can see, right. Also can I see that there are immature myeloid series cells which I can also see, right. This is the normal neutrophil, but this is a myeloblast, this is a uh, eosinophilic precursor, then this is a promyeloblast. So, there are different categories of myeloid precursors which are seen. So, that is usually seen in a case of CML where I see all stages of myeloid maturation, right? all stages of myeloid maturation can be seen. So, I make a diagnosis that this patient can have CML. What are the other tests I will do to confirm my diagnosis? Can I do a bone marrow aspirate, right? I will do a bone marrow aspirate. What it will show? It will show a high myeloid to erythroid ratio. Why? Because it is a myeloproliferative disorder, right? Increased myeloid to erythroid ratio. Plus students, two different types of cells can be seen. One is called as a pseudo gaucher cell because it looks like a gaucher cell with a crumpled tissue paper appearance of cytoplasm. And another thing which you can see is a sea blue histiocyte, you all know, with a sea blue cytoplasm, right? Then students, you can also do a NAP score and they did a NAP score and the NAP score was reduced. That is also given, NAP score is reduced. I confirm that this patient can have CML. What is the best investigation you will do to reach the diagnosis? Come on. What is the best investigation? You all know that the genetic abnormality which is present in CML is T9 is to 22 which is also called as Philadelphia chromosome, right, uh, in which there is a BCR ABL fusion transcript, right. So, to see this T922 or BCR ABL fusion transcript or Philadelphia chromosome, we can do FISH. So, fluorescent in situ hybridization is a very good investigation to see uh, and to diagnose CML. If it is positive, we immediately start the patient on imatinib misylate, also called as Gleevec. Understood? Easy? So, this is how the peripheral smear of a patient with CML looks like. The peripheral smear starts looking like a bone marrow because it shows all different categories of cells of myeloid maturation. This is the FISH analysis which is there, very, very important. It can be asked in further questions. Red is ABL and uh, green is basically BCR. This is that of a normal individual. I can see two red and two green, right? 
when i see this can you see one red and one green dire fusing with each other so there is some translocation which has happened right so this is bcr abl fusion gene and that is why this is t9 is to 22 which is seen in cml this is today the best investigation to diagnose a case of cml understood how will you approach a case you will see the history of the patient do the peripheral smear of the patient and the lab profile, lab studies, do a NAP score, do a bone marrow aspirate and then do a fish analysis. Easy? Next, this is Philadelphia chromosome, right? Now, next, next clinical scenario. A 55-year-old woman presents to the physician with lower back pain for the past two weeks. Comes to me, lower back pain, Dr. Saab, for the past two weeks, right? Also complains of mild headaches, nausea and weakness, right? So, non-specific features, I need to do an x-ray, right? So, I did an x-ray of the spine and when I did the x-ray of the spine, I saw something which is called as a lytic lesion. Can you people see? There are these holes which you can see. So, there are a lot of lytic lesions in the spine. Now... Is your brain bulb opening now, thinking about something when there are lytic lesions in the spine? Yes, I start thinking that my patient can have multiple myeloma, which has lytic lesions, right? Let us see. Then we got the CBC uh, done and the patient has got normocytic anemia with high ESR, right? We got the urine analysis done. The patient has Ben Jones proteinuria. And then, therefore, I got the protein electrophoresis of this patient done. Also, on protein electrophoresis, I saw raised gamma globulin. And then, I usually make a diagnosis that this patient has got multiple myeloma. What are the features which are going in um, Correlation with that, the patient has lower back pain, patient has got weakness, along with lytic lesions in the spine, along with high ESR, Ben Stone's proteinuria and a protein electrophoresis showing gamma globinuria, right? So, there is multiple myeloma, that is the diagnosis. So, what is the provisional diagnosis? I come to a diagnosis that this patient has got multiple myeloma. What is the next investigation you will do to reach the diagnosis? What is the investigation you will do? I can do a bone marrow aspirate. Will you do a bone marrow aspirate? Multiple myeloma is a plasma cell disorder in which there is increased number of plasma cells. Plasma cells have got cartwheel chromatin. So, when I see, I will see increased number of these kinds of cells, right? A peripheral smear will show rule formation not every time. When you do the bone marrow aspirate, you will see MOT cell. What is a MOT? It is also called as a grape-like cluster. So, a MOT cell or a morula cell or a grape-like cluster. Can you see in this image? Right? Then another thing which you can see is Russell body. What is Russell body? Intracytoplasmic inclusion. And another thing is the Dutcher body, which is an inclusion inside the nucleus. So, it is a intranuclear immunoglobulin inclusion. So, the bone marrow aspirate will show Russell body, Dutcher body or a flame cell or a mod cell all due to the excess of immunoglobulins in the cell. Understood? Easy story till now. So, I come to a diagnosis that this patient has multiple myeloma. Although major investigation which we did was protein electrophoresis, right? Then, what are the bone marrow findings in this case? You have done. Any other biochemical tests which you will do in such a case, students? So, my patient has got multiple myeloma. What are the tests which you will do? Serum calcium increased, multiple myeloma, there is hypercalcemia, there are crab lesions, so high serum calcium. Serum beta 2 microglobulin levels can be increased, that test you can do. In fact, beta 2 microglobulin is the most important prognostic factor for multiple myeloma, that is another question which you have to remember. ESR which you have already done, it is high, right? These are the other tests which you can do. Then students, lastly, 
serum albumin to globulin ratio you will do there is a reversal then the markers which you can do are CD138 also called as Syndican 1 and CD56 these are the markers which we can do for multiple myeloma understood so such a case can come to you whenever a patient presents with lytic bone lesions and crab lesions you start thinking in terms of multiple myeloma the bone marrow showing any plasma cells or there is any benstones proteinuria think in terms of plasma cell disorder like multiple myeloma easy next so let's move to the next question now okay the history is that of a 14 year old boy who presents to the emergency department with a five day history of back pain and difficulty in walking on examination the patient is febrile with pallor bruising ptk and mild hepatosplenomegaly cbc may hemoglobin is low wbc count is slightly high Platelet count is low, there is high LDH, the chest x-ray is normal. This was the peripheral smear which was given. Okay, now let me see the history once more and then come to the next point. First of all, a child with a 5-day history of back pain. Okay, pallor, bruising and PTK, splenomegaly with low hemoglobin, I am sorry, low hemoglobin, high TLC, low platelet count, high LDH count and normal chest x-ray. What do you think of? See students, whenever I see a child with PTK, purpura, pallor, hepatosplenomegaly and bone pain, the first thing which hits my mind is acute leukemia and you know what kind of acute leukemia usually occurs in children i know all is more common in children i start thinking in terms of all understood students what are the important keywords a child with fever hepatosplenomegaly pallor this kind of a blood picture along with ptk always think in terms of acute lymphoid leukemia the first thing in your mind right now let us see the image which was given this was the peripheral smear shown now when i see this peripheral smear i confirm as a clinician i confirm that whatever clinical diagnosis which i was making that is correct because what you see these are the normal rbcs but see these cells do you think these are normal lymphoid cells? No, these are not normal lymphoid cells. These cells are abnormal, right? These are actually blast cells. Now I have to differentiate whether these are lymphoblasts or myeloblasts. See the cytoplasm is very less. The chromatin is very dark and consent, condensed. So I make a diagnosis that this patient has got acute leukemia, most likely a L L. Why do I say ALL in this patient? One, the age of the patient and two, the kind of blast which I see. But students, as a clinician and as a pathologist, you don't have to say without doing staining and markers that this patient has ALL, right? What is the next investigation which you will do in this case, students? I will do special stains. What are the special stains which you will do? I will do a pass stain. If this is a case of ALL, what it will be? It will be pass positive, right? And that is ALL. If this is a case of AML, this is myeloperoxidase, non-specific esterase or SBB positive. If this is a case of AML, understood? Easy. So, you will do the next step that is you will do the staining. If this is ALL, this will be pass positive. If this is AML, these are the stains which are positive. And lastly, you will apply the markers. If this is lymphoid cell, if it is a B cell disorder, B cell ALL, it will be positive for B cell markers like 19, 20, 10. If it is a T cell thing, it will be positive for 2, 3, 4, 5, 7 and so on. And if it is AML, it will be positive for myeloid markers like CD13, 33, CD117. Easy? Right? So, 
This is the image students, how does past positivity look like? Can you people appreciate these are the lymphoblasts and it shows block positivity. It looks like a block painting is done. So this is called dot positivity or block positivity which is seen in ALL, right? Lastly students, this is the table of prognostic factors which is very frequently asked. I have told it in the videos. Please revise this table once because this is a very important table, right? So this is how we approach a case of acute leukemia. Let me revise it once again. If you see, uh, uh, first of all, see the age of the patient. If the age is lesser, start thinking in terms of ALL. If the age, age is middle-aged or elderly, start thinking in terms of AML, right? Now, in the history, look for these points. Fever, hepatosplenomegaly, pallor, fatigue, pity K. If this kind of a history is the given, think about acute leukemia. If gum bleeding is given, it goes more in favor of acute myeloid leukemia, right? See the peripheral smear of the patient. You order the peripheral smear. If you see some abnormal cells, the lymphoid or the myeloid, think about acute leukemia, right? Then there will be one or the other clue to differentiate between ALL or AML, whether it is staining which is given or whether it is markers. So look at those clues and then answer the question. Easy? Okay. Let's move to the next history students. A 25 year old woman with a history of multiple small bowel resections for Crohn's disease presents complaining of fatigue and dyspnea on exertion. So this is a young woman who has multiple small bowel resections for Crohn's disease. The patient has Crohn's disease, so the small bowel has been cut. The patient presents with fatigue and dyspnea. Physical examination, there is pallor and unsteady gait. Lab study shows a low hemoglobin and a high MCV, right? Now, with this history, what do you think of? What can this patient have? Uh, the patient has a history of small bowel resection. That is a very significant history which is given. If you resect the bowel students, what uh, element, what vitamin is not absorbed, right? Vitamin B12 deficiency anemia. Can this patient have? Another major keyword for me as a pathologist is high MCV. Remember students, I told you the causes of macrocytic anemia or high MCV. LHMC, Lady Harding Medical College, liver disease, hypothyroidism, megaloblastic anemia due to B12 or failure deficiency and cytotoxic drugs. So, I start thinking that this patient has got megaloblastic anemia due to vitamin B12 deficiency, right? And there is low hemoglobin also, right? So, let us see what is given next. The peripheral smear is given below, okay? I get the peripheral smear of this patient. Can you see that these are large oval cells, right? What is important is see the neutrophil and count the number of lobes in the neutrophil. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? There are 8 lobes in the neutrophil. That means this patient has got a hypersegmented neutrophil in the smear. And that is why I come to the conclusion that this patient has got megaloblastic anemia due to B12 deficiency. Uh, that is the diagnosis which I have made. Any other biochemical tests which you will do to confirm the diagnosis? I can do the vitamin B12 assay of the patient. Then I will do the serum methyl malonyl CoA levels which are increased. I will do the homocysteine levels which can be increased, right? What are the bone marrow findings which you will see? Megaloblastic anemia is called as megaloblastic because when you see the bone marrow, the erythroid precursors will show cells which have got a sieve like chromatin, something like this. It looks like a sieve. So that is why it is called as a megaloblast, right?
So, what are the important causes? Let us quickly see. Vegetarian diet, gastrectomy, people, eyewheel resection. So, this is a very important key word students which can be given, right? In NEET exam once there was a question on a vegetarian diet. In another exam there was a question on a gastrectomy individual, right? Most common worm, fish tapeworm, this was a direct question in INICT three years back. Clinically, there is anemia, beefy tongue, pigmentation of knuckles and neurologic complications. In this patient also, there was an unsteady gait. Pancytopenia due to nucleus cytoplasmic asynchrony and increased risk of thrombosis, right? Uh, this is the pigmentation of knuckles which can be seen and this image was exactly given in your INICT exam last to last year in 2021, right? Next, when you see the peripheral smear, you see megaloblast, sorry, macrocytes, that is larger oval cells. Then you will see a hypersegmented neutrophil. And lastly, this is what I was talking about, the erythroid precursors with sieve like chromatin. Can you people see it looks like a chalni or a sleeve? That is why this is called as a sieve like chromatin. This is seen in B12 deficiency anemia, right? So, let us quickly revise the important keywords can be there. Very important clue in the history can be a vegetarian patient or a gastrectomized individual or a patient with ileal resection. These are the three keywords or an infection with fish tape worm, right? Peripheral smear, very carefully look for hypersegmented neutrophils, right? MCV of the patient is going to be high. Next. A 64-year-old retired shipyard worker has been experiencing shortness of breath, cough and chest pain for 6 months. In that time, he has lost 14.5 kgs. Wow! He develops progressive ascites and ultimately dies due to pulmonary embolus. Autopsy results are shown. Exposure to which substance is a risk factor for this patient's disorder? Again, students, examiner's favorite topic. I always tell everybody that look at the history and anything related to their professional life which is given is a keyword. Here that term is a shipyard worker. Remember I told you that shipyard workers are exposed to a chemical called as asbestos. So, they are exposed to asbestosis and in turn they are exposed, uh, they are at increased risk of malignant mesothelioma. Now, this patient is a shipyard worker. Uh, I start thinking in my mind it can be asbestosis, right? Uh, the patient has ascites, dies and this is the lung. On the lung, can you see this whitish plaque like thing? Remember I told you asbestosis usually affects the pleura and peritoneum because the peritoneum has affected the patient as ascites affects the pleura so there is a yellowish plaque which I can see right. Exposure to which substance is a risk factor for this patient disorder? Answer is asbestos. Clearly that is the answer. So very significant and important question students because asbestosis is asked in every exam, right? So remember students, whenever there is a construction worker or a shipyard worker with the involvement of the, of the pleura or peritoneum or a image like this, start thinking in terms of asbestosis, right? And asbestosis, another thing which you have to know is on microscopy, you see ferruginous bodies or asbestos bodies. These bodies are Prussian blue positive because they are asbestos particles which are coated with iron. Understood easy? Okay, next question. This was a 65-year-old woman who presents to the medicine OPD with multiple sequelae including arthritic pain and diabetes mellitus. So, till now the keywords are my patient has got arthritis plus diabetes mellitus. Examination shows skin hyperpigmentation plus skin hyperpigmentation. Three things plus hepatomegaly so there must be some liver involvement also right liver biopsy was performed and the image is shown i will perform a liver biopsy and this was the image which is shown what do you think of very easy 
can you make the diagnosis students you have a patient with diabetes mellitus arthritis some brownish pigmentation of skin and a liver disease this is a classical tri uh, this is a classical history of a patient with hemochromatosis even if you don't have the liver biopsy this is what will you make the diagnosis after looking at the history right see the liver biopsy now can you people appreciate there is this brownish pigmentation with pigment which is seen now this pigment pigment is actually hemosiderin this pigment is actually hemosiderin right so what is the next thing which you will do which special stain will you put to reach the diagnosis i will immediately tell my technician please put a prussian blue stain or a pearl stain or a pearl stain right and what color will you see on a prussian blue or a pearl stain the color which i see is this color students that is why it is called prussian blue because iron particles which will become bluish in color can you people appreciate this blue color right so prussian blue or blue staining will be there most likely diagnosis we have already made hemochromatosis what is the pathogenesis of this disease there is usually hfe gene mutation on chromosome number 6 HFE gene mutation on chromosome number six. He may chromatosis excessive iron, and because of this HFE gene mutation, what will happen? There is decreased hepcidin level, and you all know when hepcidin level decrease, the iron level increase. So that is why there is he may chromatosis. What are the biochemical tests? I will of course do the iron levels in this patient, right? and what is the treatment the treatment usually is iron chelators which i can give like desferoxamine easy this is the uh, clinical profile students which you have to remember there is micronodular cirrhosis bronze like pigmentation of skin diabetes mellitus other symptoms can be patient as arthritic pain or testicular problems and so on understood easy so this is the type of questions uh, patients which we see in the medicine opd and this is how you can correlate medicine with pathology you have to study all these things in a integrated manner right let's move to the next one okay this is the brownish colored hemosiderin which is seen let's move to the next question A 65-year-old male immigrant from Africa presents to the emergency after an episode of gross hematuria. He states that he has seen small amounts of blood in his urine from time to time over the past several months. His physical examination is remarkable only for mild hepatosplenomegaly. Urology consult is called and a urologist performs a uh, a bed side cystoscopy. A large fungating mass is seen adherent to the superior part of the bladder. That means with this history I come to a conclusion that my patient has got a bladder cancer, right? Bladder cancer. Results of a biopsy are shown in the image. this is the biopsy image which bladder cancer do you think it is now you all know that in the urinary bladder we have two types of cancers one is transitional cell cancer another is squamous cell cancer i told you whenever there is squamous cell cancer students you will see keratin pearls can you see a lot of keratin pearls in this image lot of pink colored keratin material so my diagnosis for this question is squamous cell cancer one more question in the same video we have done on transitional cell cancer remember the transitional cell like epithelium which was there right that was tcc and this is squamous cell cancer right okay what is the most likely environmental exposure associated with the disease in this patient again a similar question students there they asked you strongest association with this cancer we marked smoking here scc is very commonly associated with what it is very commonly associated with helminthic infection like schistosoma like schistosoma that is why students the answer here is schistosoma that is the answer answer here is helminth infection correct easy let's move to the next one okay a 55 year old 
recent immigrant from Taiwan presents to the clinic with a three month history of worsening nasal congestion, epistaxis, and recurrent ear infections. Recurrent ear infections. Physical examination reveals a painless firm lymph node enlargement in the neck. CT of the head reveals a large mass situated in the upper nasopharynx, right? So, there is some problem here and there is a mass in the nasopharynx. Biopsy of the lesion shows large epithelioid cells intermixed with numerous infiltrating lymphocytes. If there is a mass in the nasopharynx, one DD which I always think of is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, right? The infectious agent directly associated with this patient's pathology is best described of which category? Wow, what a lovely question. I mean, it is a three-step question. First, with the history, I have come to a diagnosis that this patient has nasopharyngeal cancer, right? The infectious agent for nasopharyngeal cancer is Epstein-Barr virus. Now, you all know what is Epstein-Barr virus? Is it a DNA virus or a RNA virus? Tell me. It is a DNA virus. That is why the answer is a DNA virus, right? So, it's a three-step question. This is the kind which can be asked in your future exams, right? Next, a 41-year-old man visits his doctor because of increasingly painful headache, right? Now, this patient has headache. CT of the head is shown. Let me show you the CT scan. This is the CT scan of the head. If a biopsy of this tumor were obtained and you are the pathologist, what do you see under the microscope? Most likely, right? And then you make the diagnosis. Okay. Now, CT picture was this students, right? Uh, this is the tumor. I know that this patient has got a brain tumor. And this CT scan is very important students because see, don't you think it looks like a butterfly? It is called as a butterfly tumor. Why? Because it is crossing the midline also. And this butterfly tumor is usually seen in glioblastoma multiforme, GBM, right? That is my provisional diagnosis. So, if I am the pathologist, what I will next do? I will tell the surgeon to do a biopsy. Please take out the biopsy, take out the tumor mass, right? Now, the surgeon takes out the tumor, neurosurgeon takes out the tumor mass and this is the biopsy which comes to me, this kind of a biopsy, right? The biopsy is showing this is the area of necrosis and tumor cells are surrounding that area of necrosis. This is called as geographical necrosis or serpentine necrosis and this is seen in glioblastoma multiforme. So, when the neurosurgeon sends me the biopsy, I confirm the diagnosis that this patient has got glioblastoma multiforme. Why? Because the biopsy is showing serpentine necrosis. Can you people see? This pinkish area in the the middle. This is actually necrosis and I can see tumor cells are accumulating ar around the necrotic area. So, this is basically geographical or serpentine necrosis. Understood? Also, what you see is blood vessel proliferation, endothelial vascular proliferation and when the blood vessels proliferate, they start looking like a glomerulus. That is why it is called as a glomeruloid bodies, right? So, in this, can you see this proliferation of blood vessels, right? So, that there is more blood supply and this is looking like a glomerulus. So, the flashcard in pathology which I always tell is two glomeruloid bodies in pathology. One seen in glioblastoma multiforme. Another Schiller dual body which is seen in yolk sac tumor also looks like a glomerulus. That is why it is also called as a glomeruloid body. Understood? Easy? Now, you know how to solve such kinds of questions students, right? Next, a 49 year old healthy woman presents to the outpatient department with a swelling of the neck. No family history of any thyroid disorder. 
when we do the physical examination, I saw a non-tender thyroid gland with a nodule on the right side. There was a nodule. The thyroid gland is mobile on deglutition. Cervical lymphadenopathy is present. Now students, whenever there is a thyroid problem and there is cervical lymphadenopathy, two keywords, cervical lymphadenopathy and a nodule in the thyroid, you have to think of papillary carcinoma of thyroid. Remember I told you that papillary cancer of thyroid is one type of thyroid cancer which metastasizes by lymphatic root. That is why a patient commonly presents with cervical lymph node enlargement, right? So, whenever in the history you have two keywords thyroid gland nodule plus cervical lymph node enlargement, I think about papillary carcinoma thyroid. Histopathology from thyroid gland is shown below. Okay, I'll show you the histopathology. This is the histopathology. I confirm my diagnosis that this is basically papillary cancer. Why did I confirm my diagnosis, students? Why? Because there is a uh, papillae. Plus, students, very important in papillary cancer is orphan anti nuclei. Orphan any eye nuclei, right? They are optically clear nuclei. Also present are coffee bean nuclei. Can you see a groove, right? The nuclear grooves are seen very clearly in this image. So, there are nuclear grooves. Nuclei look like coffee beans. These are called as coffee bean nuclei, right? Also, in addition, I will see Samoma bodies. I will see Samoma bodies. Five things on the histopathology of papillary cancer. Papillary cancer has been asked 95% of the time in the past five years in your INICT and NEET exam, right? Five things are, which are seen on microscopy papillae with a fibrovascular core, or orphan anii nuclei, nuclear grooves, nuclear pseudo inclusions, and Samoma bodies, right? It has the best prognosis. The pathogenesis of papillary cancer of thyroid is basically BRAF or PET red PTC mutation, right? PTC mutation. Easy? And this usually metastasizes by lymphatic root. Can you tell me a risk factor for papillary carcinoma of thyroid? A very important risk factor is ionizing radiation. Understood? So, let us quickly see the image. This is an orphan anion nuclei classical. Then this is nuclear pseudo inclusion. This is a coffee bean nuclei which is seen. Then this is a Samoa body which is there, right? Uh, so, this is about papillary cancer. Please revise all the thyroid cancers carefully, right? Next, a 62-year-old man has had back pain for the past eight months. He has had a productive cough for the past two days. On physical examination, his temperature is 39 and there is dullness to percussion on the right lung base, right? Productive cough with dullness and percussion, you might think in terms of a pneumonia. Lab studies show a 4, per, four plus gram positive diplococca in the sputum. Chest radiograph shows a right lower lobe consolidation. So, basically till now, my patient has got back pain and my patient has got a lung problem, usually a pneumonia. An abdominal CT scan shows multiple lytic lesions on the vertebrae. Again, students, lytic lesion along with pneumonia, you will start thinking in terms of multiple myeloma, right? On the day prior to death, his serum urea nitrogen was 63, which is high. Creatinine was 7.1. That means my patient has got kidney disease also, right? Dipstick urine analysis was normal. At autopsy, his kidneys are firm and pale. Microscopically, there is abundant pink hyaline material in glomerula and around small vessels. This material stains positive with Congo red. Wow! Which material? Pink material is positive with Congo red. Another keyword. That means amyloid is deposited in the kidney. Can a multiple myeloma patient deposit amyloid? Yes, right. Which kind of amyloid is deposited in a patient of multiple myeloma? AL, right? Everything is correlated. Please correlate medicine and pathology. Medicine will become very beautiful if you do that, right? 
which of the following laboratory findings was most likely to have been present in this patient in the week prior to death? Very nice question students. Positive anti-nuclear antibody test. Is my diagnosis SLE? No. Therefore, this is not the answer. Serum glucose of 210. Will my patient have diabetes mellitus? No, because they are not that pink material is not uh, basically nodular glomerulosclerosis, which is seen in diabetic nephropathy. It is amyloid clearly. CD4 lymphocyte count of 110 per microliter? No. Total serum protein of 9.2, yes, this can be seen because my patient has multiple myeloma, which is a plasma cell disorder, there can be high protein level. Last, serum PSA of 11.8, no, no reason why, because this patient does not have prostatic cancer. So, I come to a diagnosis that this patient has got total serum protein more than of 9.2, easy? Clear? So, this is another type of question which is commonly asked students, multi-step question. Unfortunately, the only problem with these questions is they take a lot of time, right? Okay, next question. A 12-year-old boy is found to have auditory nerve deafness and ocular lens dislo dislocation, right? Now, you have a young boy who has got deafness and lens dislocation. If you have revised your course nicely, uh, you would already start thinking of something. When you have a child with ear, hearing problems and ocular problems, right? I have already started thinking in terms of Alport syndrome. There is a family history of renal disease with males more commonly affected than females. A urine analysis shows microscopic hematuria. That means my patient has got kidney problem also, right? Now, provisional diagnosis. With the history of kidney problem, with hearing problem, ocular dislocation, I have made my diagnosis that this patient has got Alport syndrome. So, what is the diagnosis? It is Alport syndrome. Remember students, in Alport syndrome, I always say the patient can't see, the patient can't pee and the patient can't hear a buzzing bee. The patient can't hear a buzzing bee. So, this triad of hematuria along with ocular dislocation and hearing problem always think of Alport syndrome. The, in the history, one line also which is important is the family history of renal disease is there in which males are more commonly affected. Remember, I told you that Alport syndrome is usually a X-linked dominant disorder right? That is why males are more commonly affected as compared to females, correct? Then, uh, what will you see? This is one disorder in which light microscopy is not useful. You have to see the electron microscopy and on electron microscopy, it shows a basket weave appearance. Can you people appreciate this basket weave? Right? So, this is how it looks like. This is important. Correct? Uh, this is basically a short mnemonic for Alport syndrome. Uh, there is a defect in alpha 5 chain of collagen type 4. This I have already told you. So, A for type 4 collagen defect, there is lens, cochlea, glomerulus, all three affected. In lens, there is anterior lenticonus mostly. Then there is sensory neural hearing loss. And what you will see renally in kidney are thinning and splitting of the glomerular basement membrane, which shows a basket weave appearance and it will lead to end stage renal disease. Right? Easy? Then, students, a five year old boy is noted to have increased puffiness around his eye for the past week and he has been active. Uh, less active than normal. Physical examination, he has periorbital edema. Vital signs include temperature normal, pulse rate a bit high, respiratory rate a bit high, blood pressure a bit high. Urine analysis shows 4 plus protein, no blood, no cause. 
Microscopic urine analysis reveals oval fat bodies but no WBCs or RBCs. He improves following a course of corticosteroid therapy. Now, whenever such a question is given, this is a classical history of a patient with minimal change disease. A child with periorbital edema, puffiness around his eye and some kidney problem with oval fat bodies responding to steroids is minimal change disease, right? Which of the following renal lesion is most likely to be present in this boy? Crescent? No. Podocyte foot process effacement? That is the answer. Effacement of the podocyte foot processes is the most important thing which is seen, right? Patchy acute tubular necrosis? No. Hyperplastic arteriosclerosis? No. It is seen in malignant hypertension. This child does not have malignant hypertension. Mesangial immune complex deposition? No. So, the answer here is effacement of podocyte food processes. Why? Because I made the diagnosis as minimal change disease. Easy? Next question. A three-year-old child has become more irritable over the past two months and does not want to eat much at meals. Physical examination showed enlarged abdomen and the surgeon could palpate a mass on the right side, right? So, when the surgeon ordered an abdominal CT scan, it revealed a 10 centimeter solid mass involving the right kidney. Now, students, any abdominal mass in a child, you think about two things. Any abdominal mass in a child, I either think about neuroblastoma, or I think about nephroblastoma or Wilms tumor. Anna? Any abdominal mass? Here there is a mass in the right kidney. So, such a big mass in the right kidney, you start thinking that my patient can have a nephroblastoma, right? A Wilms tumor. Histopathology from the resected mass is shown. So, this was the histopathology which was received and the histopathology showed three different elements. In this image, can you see this one element? This looks like a mesenchymal element. Then these are small round blue cells arranged in tubules, right? So, this is basically the epithelial element, right? So, you have epithelial element, mesenchymal element, stromal elements in a small round blue cell tumor. I make a diagnosis that this patient has got a Wilms tumor. Which gene is affected? WT1 gene is affected. Which chromosome is affected? Chromosome 11, right? So, this is how we reach the diagnosis of a Wilms tumor. Next, a 68-year-old woman undergoes a left total hip replacement. She requires two units of PRBCs during the procedure. Following surgery, she is stable with a hematocrit of 30%. A week later, she develops a UTI from an indwelling catheter which is complicated by pyelonephritis. A day later, her blood pressure was very low. Peripheral smear showed schistocytes. She receives 5 units of fresh frozen plasma. As the 5th unit is being transfused, she develops sudden severe dyspnea and begins coughing up large quantities of frothy sputum. Chest radiograph shows bilateral pulmonary edema. She is most likely to have developed a transfusion reaction to which of the following components of blood? Excellent question students. These are the kinds which are asked these days. Important here is that the patient has got a transfusion reaction. I have to diagnose what transfusion reaction is this. When the patient was transfused FFP, after the fifth unit, the patient had dyspnea, uh, the patient has frothy sputum and bilateral pulmonary edema. Don't you think the patient can have trolley, transfusion related acute lung injury, right? right? That must have happened. Lung injury, bilateral pulmonary edema is there, right? And trolley is usually against which blood component? Is it against albumin? No. Fibrinogen? No. Granulocytes? Yes. So, the answer here is granulocytes, transfusion associated acute lung injury usually develops within less than 6 hours of transfusing blood to a patient. On x-ray, we see a white out appearance, right? Next, a 40-year-old woman has noted enlargement of her anterior neck region for the past 8 months. 
physical examination temperature pulse respiratory rate everything is normal bp is a bit high there is diffuse symmetrical thyroid enlargement without tenderness thyroid gland enlargement without any tenderness think about either hashimoto's thyroiditis or four types of thyroid cancer papillary follicular medullary anaplastic right if there is cervical lymph node enlargement papillary cancer next chest x-ray normal lab studies shows u thyroid with serum ionized calcium high this is an important point which lesion of thyroid whatever i have mentioned has hypercalcemia medullary cancer of thyroid right fnac of the thyroid shows a neoplasm she is taken up for surgery frozen section showed thyroid masses Compo uh, with malignant neoplasm composed of polygonal cells and nests. So, the cells are present in nests, right? Again, this type of frozen section also points towards a diagnosis of medullary cancer, right? So, for students with the short history which is given, you have to think that what all differential diagnosis can be there. I mean, if there is an enlargement of the neck, what all possibilities are there when you make that then you see the minor things like high serum calcium polygonal cells and nest then i start thinking that this patient can have medullary cancer of thyroid right now further thyroidectomy was performed what is your provisional diagnosis my provisional diagnosis is medullary cancer of thyroid any stain which you can do to confirm the diagnosis remember students which type of carcinoma of thyroid produces amyloid answer is uh, medullary a cal calcitonin is the marker which you will do right and the stain which you will apply is congo red that is the stain for amyloid medullary cancer can show amyloid right the marker which you will apply it is calcitonin and the genetic defect which can be associated it can be associated with men 2 syndrome and red on chromosome 10 right now any of these things can be asked in the mcqs or can be given as a keyword understood how do we proceed with the case of a thyroid cancer right next an otherwise healthy 45 year old man comes to the physician because of a three week history of progressive epigastric heartburn and weight loss the pain tends to be more severe at night and occurs one to three hours after meals during the day he has had similar episodes with lesser intensity during the past year abdominal examination shows tenderness on deep palpation test of the stool for occult blood is positive endoscopy shows a bleeding three centimeter ulcer in the antrum of the stomach there is a ulcer in the antrum Photomicrograph of steen silver stain tissue from a biopsy of the gastric mucosa adjacent to the ulcer is shown. This is a picture and very beautifully in this picture students on the silver stain I can see this black organism that means I make a diagnosis that my patient has got H. pylori induced ulcer right. Which of the following processes is most likely to be involved such a nice question and these are the kinds which are asked these days right. Now, elaboration of proteases and ureases with local dis tissue destruction, yes, that can be the answer because H. pylori has a urease which leads to destruction, right? So, this is the answer. Hyperacidity and gastric ulcer development, no. Ingestion of contaminated well water, no. Spirochete invasion, no. Giardia invasion, no. You all know that with this image i make a diagnosis this patient has got h pylori induced ulcer and this h pylori the basic pathogenesis is a uh, kage vake for gastric adenocarcinoma and ureases for ulcer understood next a 30 year old man is admitted to the hospital for evaluation he has a six week history of colicky abdominal pain and diarrhea with occasional blood Three days after admission, he suddenly develops peritonitis and sepsis. Despite appropriate care, he dies. At autopsy examination, shows a fibrinous exudate over the peritoneal and serosal surfaces. A punctate opening is seen in the wall of the thickened loop of small intestine. 
Several lengths of small and large intestine are also thickened and adherent to one another with marked areas of narrowing, right? Photomicrographs of section of colon are shown. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? Now, this colon, this picture. In this question, this picture is very important. When you see this biopsy from the picture, can you people appreciate that this is actually a granuloma with a giant cell? And these are a lot of, um, you know, spindle shaped cells. These are epithelioid cells. So, this is an epithelioid cell and this is a giant cell and this entire thing is actually a granuloma. Now, can you tell me a GIT problem which has a granuloma? Crohn's disease. That is why the answer here is Crohn's disease. Very important, right? Easy? Next. A previously healthy 40-year-old woman is brought to the emergency department by her husband because of a two-day history of fever, lethargy and confusion. Her temperature is high, pulse is high, respiration is normal, BP is a bit high. Physical examination shows scattered PTK and ecchymosis over the lower extremities. Neurologic examination shows moderate generalized motor weakness. She is oriented to person but not to place or time. That means some CNS problem is also there. Lab studies show. Now, before I go to the lab studies, let us mark the important keywords. Middle-aged women with a very short history of fever, there is some neurological problem and there is PTK. Understood? And ecchymosis and purpura. Hemoglobin decreased, hematocrit decreased, TLC normal, platelet count decreased, PT normal, APTT normal, urea normal, lactate dehydrogenase increased, right? Okay, do you think of anything till now? A patient with PTK purpura, with neurological problems, fever, low platelet count, high LDH. Can you think of something? I have started thinking of something. I think that this patient can have TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Remember I told you TTP has got neurological problems, right? HUS more commonly will present with renal problems, but TTP usually presents with neurological problem and it has got thrombocytopenia. So, there is decreased platelet count. The LDH level is also high. What other tests will you do? I will do a platelet count, uh, sorry, I will do a peripheral smear in this patient. The peripheral smear might show schistocytes or Helmet cells are fragmented red cells, right? Then I can also do a retic count because it is a hemolytic anemia that can be high. I will do an unconjugated bilirubin. Sometimes that can also be high, right? And what is the pathogenesis of this disorder if they ask you? There is a defect in Adam TS13. That is the basic defect. Understood? Okay, next question. Peripheral blood smear shows 3 plus polychromacy and 3 plus schistocytes. You have done. Blood cultures grow no organism. Chest x-ray shows no abnormalities. Which is the most likely diagnosis? Why will, uh, will I, why my patient has AML? No. A autoimmune hemolytic anemia? No. TTP? Yes. So, I have made a diagnosis of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Toxic shock syndrome? No. Von Willebrand's disease? No. Easy? Next, a four-year-old boy from Brazil is brought to the physician because of one week history of painful swelling of his jaw and pressure around his eyes. Okay, a child with a jaw swelling. Remember I told you, what will you think of? A child with a jaw swelling and the child is from Brazil, right? What will you think of? Immediately, I start thinking in terms of Burkitt lymphoma. Let us see. He is at 80, 80th percentile for height and weight. Physical examination shows a single 12 into 10 centimeter lesion on the right side of the jaw with irregular edges. Photomicrograph of the incisional biopsy is shown. 
see the biopsy and I confirm whatever I was thinking was right. On the biopsy, I am seeing starry sky appearance and this starry sky appearance is seen in Burkitt's lymphoma. What is the question? Which of the following processes is most likely occurring in the region indicated by arrows? Okay, this is indicated by arrow. What are these cells, students? These are basically macrophages or histiocytes, right? which are looking like stars in the sky and what is this process the process is apoptosis so they are usually indicating apoptosis such a nice question because you all can make a diagnosis but what is asked around it we always get confused other things which are asked usually in the INICT or NEET exam around it are CMYC mutation T8 is to 14 mutation high chi 67 index right these days another site which is very commonly asked is the peritoneum or they will give you a history of a git lesion correct so you should know the inside out about burkitt lymphoma next a 43 year old woman has felt a large breast lump that has increased slowly in size for the past three years Physical examination, 9 cm firm movable mass in her left breast. The ovaline skin appears normal, there is no lymphadenopathy. Mass is excised, grossly soft and fleshy. Microscopically, uh, it shows a lymphoid stroma with little fibrosis with vesicular cells and frequent mitosis, right? Now, a breast tumor with lymphoid stroma, immediately I start thinking in terms of medullary carcinoma of the breast. Understood? Easy? Next, a 16-year-old boy has had easy bruising, petechiae and gum bleeding for the past two months, right? Physical examination, the temperature is normal, pulse rate is normal, respiratory rate is normal, BP is normal, a neurologic status is normal, everything was normal. Lab study, hemoglobin approximately normal, platelet count low, right? TLC normal, PT is normal, partial thromboplastin time is 28 seconds, that is also normal, right? So, till now, the important thing is it's a young boy with bruising, petechiae, gum bleeding and low platelet count but PT and APTT are normal. Bone marrow biopsy is performed, it is shown. Test for anti-platelet uh, antibody that is GP2B3A is positive. What is the diagnosis which you will make? Do not even see the bone marrow biopsy. I made a diagnosis that this patient has got ITP, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, where the platelet count is low, all the other tests are normal and there is bruising and petechiae. That means it is definitely a bleeding disorder, right? This is the image which was given students in the bone marrow aspirate. Can you people appreciate that there are these Megakaryocytes which are high in number. So, increased number of megakaryocytes with this clinical profile is diagnostic of immune thrombocytopenic purpura or ITP. So, what is the most likely diagnosis ITP? What is the most appropriate treatment? If it is acute ITP, it is a self-limiting condition. You don't need to do anything, right? If it is a chronic ITP, we need to give steroids or you need to give some immunosuppressive drugs because it is a immune-mediated uh, disorder, type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. Understood students? So, these are the kinds of clinical vignettes and these are the kinds of next type questions which can be asked in your exams. Again, I am repeating two very important things which I feel are essential for cracking MCQ exam. One, revise. Revision from the same source is very important. If you do something once or twice, it does not register in our brain. You have to keep revising it and that too from the same place. If you tell me, ma'am, I've done pathology from 
your notes from robins from harsh mohan from another app you will not remember anything one source is very important just trust one source and start doing it so revision is one thing which is important and second is integrated study all the paraclinical subjects integrate them with your clinical subjects like whenever you are studying git uh, integrate that medicine and surgery git with pathology it will become more interesting you will become better doctors and you will be able to crack your mcq exam as well right and keep doing your hard work your day will definitely come right thank you so much students and all the best